right, up next we have Dr. James Hickman for Rare Story 3. He's a professor with the University of Central Florida and co-founder and chief scientific officer of Hesperos. It's right up here. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm actually a part of this community. I have an undiagnosed peripheral neuropathy, which I've been dealing with for the last 15 years. Um, so I understand some of your frustrations, but I also want to show you that there's hope in many of the um, projects and systems that we're being able to develop. Um, so I'm at the university. A lot of the things that we uh, came up with, whereas my co-founder, Michael Schuler, and I, and I formed this company about eight years ago. And I want to highlight the company because everything I'm going to show you is commercially available as part of a CRO. Okay? So these aren't just sort of laboratory things. You say, well, you might have application in 10 years. These are all commercially available right now. The company was founded by my shoulder and I about uh, eight years ago. We've licensed a bunch of patents from UCF and Cornell. We've won the Lush Prize. We've gotten great support from NIH over the years. We've established international and national contracts with therapeutic developers, many of them rare disease developers. We've got a 14,000 square foot facility in Orlando, Florida. We've got about 50 people at the company right now. And we're the first company to actually get a drug repurposed, okay, into a clinical trial using only data from one of our systems, and I'll go through that. And so what do we do that's different? We, you, When you go into a doctor's office, he doesn't immediately stick a needle in your arm to be able to take out fluid, look at biomarkers, right? They'll say, well, you know, how are you walking? How are you talking? Are you making sense? He listens to your heart. He checks your reflexes. What he's looking for is clinically relevant functional readouts. Are your muscles contracting okay? Is your cardiac electrical activity okay? Is your neuronal activity okay? Is your neuromuscular junction uh, uh, working correctly? And so what we can do, we can actually do all these things and reproduce them um, um, by, by basically putting, that's slow, you know, like cells on top of cantilevers so we can actually look at muscle contraction. We can pattern cardiomyocytes over top of electrodes. We can also put down skeletal muscle on, on top of um, cantilevers to be able to get force. We can also make neuronal patterns. We can still look at biomarkers, but this allows us to do this acutely, okay, but also more importantly, chronically, non-invasively, without cell death. Okay, so we're not using death markers for these systems. We can also get mechanistic insights out of this as well. So how does this work? What we can do, we can take all these different um, cells, okay, put them on their own chips, put them into a platform, put down a gasket on top, put a serum-free recirculating media, just like the recirculating media in your blood, and then put down a top on it and then basically put this together to be able to then monitor these systems over a period of up to a month, okay? And the whole system is this. That platform is in the palm of my hand. There's no extra tubing, okay? There's no extra pumps. There's no huge uh, compartments to be able to make this run. We use gravity to pump it, but all those different chips are on this is what I'm holding in my hand. Okay, so I'm going to now go through a bunch of different rare diseases and show you the platforms for it. The first thing I'm going to talk about is ALS. So what we can do, we can actually take motor neurons um, from ALS patients, okay, with all the different mutations, SOD1, FOS, TDP43, C9. We can differentiate them all from patient cells, okay, for both motor neurons, for muscle, from Schwann cells. We can put them, motor neurons on one side, grow axons through tunnels, to be able to then innervate muscle on the other side, be able to do motion capture, and then be able to look into in terms of stimulation, look at muscle contraction, and then for, say, something like ALS, you actually get some skipping, okay? And we can actually, with therapeutics, show that we can actually reverse that, okay? And so, again, getting this idea of clinically relevant functional readouts, we went to somebody who's running clinical trials for, for ALS uh, at Mass General, and so what are some of the tests you have a patient do during a clinical trial? One of them is they have to, to do a task with their hands faster and faster. And what happens is they start getting jitters and they start to lose grip strength. 
Well, we can actually reproduce that, okay? Because we can stimulate the, the motor neurons faster and faster, and if we see skipping, that's jitters. If we see loss of tetanus, that is loss of grip strength, okay? And this was published uh, in Advanced Therapeutics, Nadine Gao, who's sitting down here, who has a poster you can go to and talk and get more details, okay, and publish this, okay? And so what we're able to do is to establish, okay, the fact that we get fatigue index is increased in these systems. Um, you can clearly see that the, this is the tetanus that we measure in our systems. This is the clinical trial uh, me uh, measure of fatigue index that you get, okay? And you can see, clearly see that the fatigue index is going up for these different mutations, okay? We can actually then have shown with therapeutics, we can actually see that reversed, okay? And again, you can look at also look and see the, uh, again, for these different mutations, you can see that the wild type, you don't see any of the loss of fidelity, but you see it with the mutations. This is the jitters they see in the clinical trials, okay? This is here, you see partial loss of tetanus, total loss of tetanus. And again, in this particular case, we had wild type or healthy muscle on the other side. So we know the depth was at the neuromuscular junction, which gives us some aspect to be able to treat this. Now what we did is we can also take and make the Schwann cells, which are also part of the neuromuscular junction, take the mutations from them as well. And we did a trial with Apellus, which is a rare disease company, okay, where what they wanted to do is they have a complement inhibition um, drug. And so they said, could you actually build in the immune system? So we put the microglia on the motor neuron side, and we put um, Schwann cells and either unactivated or, acti uh, or activated monocytes, okay, on the other side. And then we actually then looked at the uh, results, and this is the unactivated monocytes. You see, when you add in complement, which is part of the innate immune system, okay, you see a deficit with the unactivated monocytes, and the drug corrected it, okay? In the activated monocytes, which means inflammation, you see a large deficit, okay, but again, their drug reversed it. And you see, again, for fatigue index, not much change with the unactivated monocytes, but with inflammation, you definitely see a reversal. And there's been a big deal about this idea of the biomarker, um, which is a neurofilament light. You can see here, again, without much change in the unactivated monocytes, you can see here there was a decrease in neurofilament light. This data was used by Apellus to be able to get a drug for orphan drug des uh, uh, designation status, okay, and also for an IND just using the data from the system. We didn't use an animal model for this at all. We can also use the same platform for myasthenia gravis, okay? As many of you are aware of, myasthenia gravis, a couple of people have already talked about this beforehand, causing muscle weakness at the neuromuscular junction. Um, these are all some of the symptoms, okay, that you get. But what you're basically having is you're getting antibodies, the acetylcholine receptors on the muscle, which blocks the signals coming from the axons, Okay, and you can also get internalization, or you can also get complement deposition in these systems, so you activate the immune system. Okay, so we actually just showed you can actually do a dose response curve for these antibodies to be able to show the toxicity for the anticholinergic uh, antibodies. Regular antibodies didn't cause any changes. And again, we, we, mod we basically quantified this. And then we based, look, went to look and see the differences between either the um, blocking or the internalization effect, we're able to show that in the uh, untreated with the things, we have the receptors on both sides. And if we actually then treat it with a low concentration, we see a down regulation on the outside, but still on the inside, high concentrations of the antibody, you see a loss of reception. And basically this a model was used um, for a number of clinical trials. One just got approved for Dianthus, okay, using just this mo uh, model for their therapeutic getting into a phase two clinical trial. And again, all this data is published. This was in Frontiers in Cell and Developmental Biology. So we're validating this by actually getting it through clinical trials, but also validating it by publishing everything from the company. Um, we are also working with another uh, rare disease, charcot marie tooth disease, um, where what we did is we took, and this was a, a situation where you have rare diseases, and then you have very rare variants of that rare, rare disease. This was a clinical trial of one working with Vanda Pharmaceuticals where we took the fibroblast from a child who had the disease 
turn them into stem cells, and then differentiated from those stem cells, the motor neurons and the muscle, again, for the same platform, this neuromuscular junction platform, okay? And these are just some markers just showing that these really are motor neurons that we've created. These are the two main markers for it. And what we did is we, did, we didn't see as much of the jitters, okay, the fatigue index, but that's also, you don't see that clinically for Charcot Marie tooth disease. What you do is you see weakness, okay? And that's what we saw in the, in the fatigue index. We saw a weakness across all the days of treatment. And you can actually see the tetanus, okay, this is in a wild type, and this is the tetanus changes, okay, we saw with the disease. And if we tracked it in terms of classical tetanus, you see for the wild type, most cases you have, but you have unclassical tetanus, which basically what happens is you're getting sporadic tetanus. So it, think about it in terms of what we're monitoring is just a single axon going to a single muscle. Well, every muscle in your body is a bundle of these things. And what happens if you're actually in Charcot Marie tooth disease, if you're getting chaotic um, signals, what you do is you're getting, as you sum them up, you're getting about 50%, okay, uh, at any one time, okay, so you get a weakness. But every occasionally, they all line up so they all have this, this um, chaotic event occurring at the same time, and now you get a fall. This is the classical um, clinical symptoms for Charcot Marie tooth disease. Now what we did is we worked with Vanda to be able to, again, you see this chaotic um, tetanus in the system, we treat it with a antisense oligonucleotide, okay? And you see here how it smoothed it out in all of these different systems. So now we have an antisense nucleotide for this patient, which has now been approved to go into a clinical trial, okay? Where we can actually, again, look at a patient of one, real precision medicine, with these systems. And this whole process from getting the, the patients, the cells, through to getting to the, uh, um, the ASO dosing was less than a year, okay? And a fraction of the cost it would take for an animal model to develop. We're also developing myelination models. So myelination is the insulation that goes down over your motor neurons, okay? Uh, we pr published this uh, a while ago in chem ACX Chemical Neuroscience. So a company saw this and said, well, can you actually create a model for multifocal motor neuropathy and CIDP, okay, which are both peripheral neuropathies? We said, well, okay, um, what happens is you get antibodies uh, against the nozeron VA, which are kind of like the, the amplification points along this myelination. And we said, well, okay, we can do that. And again, what they're trying to do is they're trying to prevent complement, which is, again, part of the innate immune system from depositing. And again, here what we're doing, we're not using mutations of the cells, we're using the patient sear sample. You see complement deposition from two patients. What you see here is their molecule prevented it. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to build a model to be able to look at, perf to look at conduction velocity. So what uh, our, our team of engineers, Dr. Long is the chief engineer, is in the audience, okay, did is we turned that NMJ model 90 degrees, and now we have the electrodes going through the tunnels where the axons are going, so we can actually measure conduction velocity in this system. And we can actually then, use then the, the, elect, the events that we see, we want to see over three different electrodes. We can then sum that together in this particular, this was the key experiment, where again, what we have untreated conduction velocity, um, untreated with the serum plus the isotope control, and then the serum plus their molecule. And again, you see for the control, Okay, you get nice applications. But you see here, the isotype control, you get abolished from the conduction velocity, but with their molecule, okay, it, it was uh, maintained. This was actually put into an IND, which enabled this clinical trial, which is ongoing right now. And this is published with Sanofi in Advanced Therapeutics. And again, all these models are being done without cell death. We're not looking at death markers. We're looking at things that a clinician would be wanting to observe from a patient when they came into their office. Okay, we're also looking at a model for um, long-term potentiation. Uh, long-term potentiation is the foundation for learning and memory in your brain. We're applying this, okay, for um, looking at Alzheimer's disease, but it's also applicable to things like frontal temporal dementia. Um, 
You can see here what we're doing is we reproduced um, this idea of um, learning and memory is normally done with slices of animal tissue where they put an electrode on one side. They stimulate it and then they record over here. And we can reproduce that by taking human cortical neurons and over electrodes, pattern them, so we can actually then record on the unstimulated le electrodes over here to be able to reproduce what they would see with the animal slice data. But this is all with human in a high throughput system. And again, um, this was published in Stem Cell Reports. The key, uh, main author has a poster upstairs, Kavina. Uh, she'll be presenting that as well. Um, and what we were able to do is to prove that we could do LTP because we then took and blocked the two main receptors for LTP, the NMD receptors and the AMP receptors, to show we really have LTP. Okay? And then just to prove it, we basically took the A beta scrambled with patch clamp like the physiology, A beta 42, which is one of the key things for Alzheimer's, and then an Alzheimer's drug and show we could actually reverse that and show we could reproduce that data on the, a on the MEAs. Okay? And again, all doing this without cell death, and just really showing that we can actually get um, in a, a factor where we can get reversal of that. Um, and also we can do this with tauopathies. And again, uh, frontal temporal dementia is a tauopathy. So there's two main parts, okay, in there. There's a beta, 42 for Alzheimer's. There's also tau. Tau is also involved in looking at, um, for other rare diseases um, in the brain. You can see we can also see this in, in tau being abolished this, was published in Alzheimer's and Dementia. And we can also, again, do this mutations, where we do, uh, there's three different mutations in, in AD, um, Priscillin 1, Priscillin 2, ApoE4. We'd be able to then reproduce that. We've all now started doing this with mutations for tau for frontal temporal dementia. So this is a very busy slide. It basically just shows you know, the whole um, progression of internal, one of the first multi-organ systems. This is one of the more advanced faulty organ systems here, where we're looking at opioid overdose and recovery in off-target -to toxicity models. But more importantly, it shows that we can actually, again, create these models, okay, for many different um, organ types in the system. And again, they're reconfigurable. So I, don't, I can take out a cardiac chip and put it in a pancreas chip. It's not that much of a problem in our models, okay? Because our philosophy is we can custom build what people want, okay, for their disease. Um, but again, showing this here, what makes it really important is that um, it's a low volume system as well. So we can actually see the effect of parent and metabolite in the same system. This was shown in a, a project with AstraZeneca. What we wanted to do was looking at parent metabolite and then predict what would happen for in vivo models, okay? So be able to take this. So not only do you need a platform to show the therapeutic is working, but then you also need some way of determining first dosing in humans. And again, many times you have to use animals for that. We're then we're trying to, re, to, to get rid of that portion of it too. So we did terafenidine affects affenidine in this model. Um, terafenidine causes QT prolongation, which is why it was pulled off the market. Um, affects affenidine, which is marketed as Allegra, does not have that. You can see without liver and then with liver. And then again, without liver, um, we see an IC50 or 33 micromolar um, with liver. We don't see any effects. And again, all without cell death, okay? Which allows us to create these models for pharmacokinetics and pharmadynamics, which is really what it's saying is, you know, how long does the drug last in your body and what does it do at the organs where you need to have an effect, okay? And we can create these models, okay, which we did in this publication with AstraZeneca to be able to predict pharmacokinetics and pharmadynamics. But the important thing is we were able to extrapolate that to models for guinea pig, dog, and non-human primate and get very good agreement. And we've also reproduced that for malaria. The Gates Foundation did that. We created malaria on a chip and predicted um, um, what would be the dosing in humans. And we have a, Dr. Long has a poster upstairs. You can get more details of that as well. Lastly, I wanted to talk about a cancer system. Okay, and again, looking at cancer rare diseases, um, we were challenged by Roche to be able to take that heart liver model, put in cancer cells, one in multidrug cystic cancer, one in non-multidrug cystic cancer. And again, just another variation of that platform where we, again, we can reconfigure this in many different ways. And what we did is we looked at tamoxin. Tamoxin is not a very good chemotherapeutic, okay? But in the uh, 
So by itself, it's not, not effective. With the liver present, its metabolite is, okay, and for the non-multidrug resistant uh, cancer, we saw decreases in proliferation, again, for the metabolite. For the multidrug resistant cancer, we didn't see any problems, okay, until, but then when we actually block the channel, which pumped out the chemotherapeutic as fast as it goes in, we actually saw a de decrease in proliferation for this drug-drug combination. And as you all know, for cancer right now, drug-drug combinations are the way to go. But what the key thing was is we also looked at the off-target toxicity for this drug-drug combination and showed that for conduction velocity of cardiac cells, you got a decrease but recovery for tamoxifen. For cardiac force, a decrease but recovery. And then beat frequency, a, car, a, a re reduction but recovery. But for the drug-drug combination, you saw a decrease but no recovery. Again, decrease but no recovery for force and then partial with um, beat frequency. But again, we weren't killing the cells. So again, for um, rare cancers, okay, we can actually take the cancer and be able to look not only on how the efficacy of it, but also the off-target toxicity, which is going to be really, really important to be able to get that approved, okay, for um, putting into patients. And this was published in Science, Translate, Science Translational Med uh, Medicine with Roche and featured in Francis Collins' blog. Um, and last thing, we can actually create an innate immune system on the chip. Uh, I'm out of time. I'm on my last slide. Um, and basically just show that we can actually get recirculating immune cells. We've been able to reproduce both aspects of that on a chip. Um, again, been highlighted in Financial Times, many different publications in terms of this possibility. Um, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thank you for the invitation. They do all the work, not me. It was our last Christmas party. Okay. And again, to emphasize, one of the biggest problems many of the speakers have said is we got seven to 10,000 rare diseases. There's only treatments for less than 10% because there are no models, right? You can get a diagnosis. You can have a therapeutic developer, but if they don't have a model to test it in, you cannot get the data to get into a, to a clinical trial. We can provide those models through HESPROS, okay? So just letting you know, there are alternative platforms out there besides animals. And please, not only just us, but there are other companies out there you need to look at these new microphysiological systems as an alternative to using animal models for rare diseases. Thank you.